and Counter Therapy Program. It was in 1983. Animals were not considered therapeutic. Animals were dirty and had no business in local facilities. We begged and borrowed. One local skilled nursing facility allowed us to bring animals in. Now I tell you, back in 1983, they had every reason to be concerned about pet therapy. There were no regulations. We would go into our adoptions department, we would see a cute puppy, and we would say, come on over with us, and go to a facility visit. We wouldn't test for behavior, we wouldn't test for any kind of medical issues, and we would take the animals over. So since that uh, slow start, we now travel to about 40 facilities a month. We have about five to seven facilities that come here on a regular basis, and we also do hospice and independent visits. We work with every kind of clientele that you can imagine. Um, children, psychiatric clients, people with Alzheimer's, um, active duty military. So it's really grown beyond that skilled nursing facility. Now there's two forms of animal therapy. The technical terms are AAA and AAT. AAA stands for Animal Assisted Activities. And that's about 98% of what you see out there in the animal therapy. It's where somebody is bringing in a cute dog, somebody is enjoying that dog, it's a very organic experience, it goes wherever that client really wants it to go, and there's not any goals or directions in it. Then there's Animal Assisted Therapy where you're working towards a specific goal or a specific outcome with a therapist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, psychiatrist, physician, and you're working towards that goal with the client and with the animal. So that tends to be a little bit more specialized. Um, and so about 95% of what we do in our program is the animal assisted activities, okay? Now benefits of animal assisted therapy. What have you guys heard? What are some of the benefits that you've heard with animal assisted therapy? Lowers your blood pressure. Lowers your blood pressure. That's one of the big ones. Yes. Well, with elderly people, it changes their focus from an internal one to an external one. Broadens Excellent. Their horizon. Definitely. Yes. You can bring a hospice patient who is disconnected with the human population aware when there's an animal there, they'll react to an animal. Definitely, and it can bring them out where, like you said, they can't connect with a human that's in their room. So there's a lot of different benefits. There's physical and emotional. The physical benefits, lower blood pressure, less medication needed, um, people heal faster. They did a huge study in New York with cardiac patients, and they measured their stress hormones, and then they had a control group that received no visits, and then measured their stress hormones through the roof, obviously. They were very severe cardiac clients. Then they had a human volunteer come in and they thought, well, it's kind of take down those stress hormones. No, through the roof. If you've ever been in the hospital, when I was in the hospital, it's like, what do I look like? You know, what am I, you know, what am I going to talk to them about? It's so much, you know, pressure and frustration when somebody can sometimes come into your room. When the animals came in the room, it was the only thing that lowered their stress hormones. So there's been a lot of studies that show the physical side. But the emotional side, I think, is just as important, if not more important. There is a complete acceptance with an animal. There is no judgment. It is unconditional love. For some of the, the clients that have psychiatric issues, their parents have turned away, their families have turned away, their friends have turned away. Our animal is the only thing in their life that doesn't turn away, that doesn't judge them for what they've done in their past. They accept them for who they are at the moment. For clients with Alzheimer's, there's so much pressure. Don't you remember me? I'm your daughter. Don't you remember you're in room 306? This frustration that they can't remember. And if they think that Chester is their dog from 40 years ago, Chester says, okay, I'm, I'm rusty. I'm your, you know, your German shepherd from 40 years ago. That sounds good. He accepts them for who they are at the moment and doesn't demand something they can't give. Um, for some of the kids that we work with that are dealing with a lot of abuse, the animal is not going to question them about what happened. They're just going to listen. They are the perfect listeners. We've had kids that will lift up the ear of a dog and tell the dog about the abuse that they've dealt with where they won't tell a counselor. And that's a pretty big breakthrough. And then we then tell the counselor, so in later sessions the counselor can be working on what that child said. Uh, we have had um, clients that have had strokes that will speak for the first time to an animal that haven't spoken in months. Because again, humans, we tend to finish each other's sentences, guess the word that you're trying to say, and if it takes them five minutes to figure out what they want to say, Chester is just going to stay there and listen. 
So there's incredible benefits with this type of work. And something that I forgot to ask you at the start is how many of you do have existing programs at your facilities? About how many um, animals do you, or how many visits do you do? We've only done three. three visits. Okay, so we it's still at the, start, the starting level. Well, okay, we excellent. Take cats, bunnies, and a dog. Yeah, and, and we'll get into a lot. We bring a lot of different species. And you'll be surprised what species can be therapeutic. And what kind of program do you have? Um, ours is temporarily on hold right now, but we had about 30 to 40 facilities that we were Excellent, excellent. And really, with all of this talk today, it's going to seem overwhelming with a lot of things you hear over these three days, but a, a pet encounter therapy program can start with one dog, with one nice cat, with one nice rabbit, and it's better to start small, get all of your protocols, all of your procedures, all of your training in place before opening up and rolling it out where you're not able to give to the community what you want to be able to offer. And there's times where we've stopped our program for six weeks to reassess what we're doing and making sure we're staying on the cutting edge of the infectious disease protocols, things like that. So it's always good as well to stop the program, see are we really meeting the needs of our community and are we doing it in the best way possible, and then go forward with the program. So types of facilities, I talked a little bit about the types that we go to. Um, skilled nursing, hospitals, we work with high-risk pregnancies. We found that there is a unit here in San Diego that have women that sometimes have to stay in bed for two to three months. Very upset about what's happening to their unborn baby, possibly very upset about pets that they've left behind and siblings that, you know, to this unborn child that are being taken care of by family. It's a very stressful time and they have nothing to distract them except for this sweet little boy right here, Chester will come and cuddle against their pregnant bellies and just sit with them. And they can just enjoy the touch of Chester, but also talk with me and kind of vent and talk about their frustration that they're dealing with. We're working with the active duty military dealing with the PTSD. And um, that program is really neat. We have a group of Marines and um, gentlemen and women who are in the Navy. They come here to the center, they spend two hours. The first hour is all about pet therapy, just enjoying the animals, socializing puppies, getting kissed on, hugging horses, and then they give back for an hour. These are men and women who have served their country, who have spent their adult lives giving and taking care of, and that's been taken away from them, they feel, with the treatment they're getting, and they want to give back. And so, and it's great physical work. We have them leveling out our stalls, what would have taken our staff probably about two days to do with decomposed granite and leveling out the stalls took the Marines a half an hour. <laughs> yeah. And um, they uh, cleaned out, how many of you have big walk-ins that get absolutely trashed with the food supplies? You know, like the food gets spilled and then there's kernels everywhere and there's dust and there's dirt and whatever there's in there. It takes our staff, you know, about four hours to unload it, clean it out, and load it back in 15 minutes with the Marines. <laughs> yeah, so they're a wonderful resource, and they feel so great. And what we did last time with the Marines is we had them, half of them grooming the horses, half of them leveling out the stalls. And there was this one gentleman who is so traumatized by, I think he, two or three tours over in the war, that he um, bursts out, he can't hold a job, he's angry all the time, he's losing all of his relationships, and he's never not agitated. And the psychiatrist happened to be on that visit, and he watched this guy go over to Dante, one of our horses, who was biting all of the rest of the Marines, and he just walked over to him and just laid his arms around his neck and kind of bur buried his face in his mane, and they sat that way for like five minutes. And the horse, which bit everybody else, just sat there and let this man hug on him, and it's the first time the psychiatrist has ever seen him peaceful since he's returned from the war. So that's the power that these animals, you know, that they can offer. So how we choose our facilities is based on need. Um, you kind of prioritize. You know, if you've got an independent living facility, these people can get out, they can enjoy their community, they can often have dogs living in their apartments. Then you've got the next level, which is assisted living. They may not be able to have dogs living with them, but they can get out and enjoy their community. Then you've got skilled nursing. So you want to prioritize and hit the facilities that really don't have an opportunity to have animals in their lives in any other way unless you bring them out. So um, also, if some facilities really want to visit, but it's not really high on our priority, we offer them to come here to the center, and they can enjoy our animals. It's less use of our resources than going out to their facility, but they still get that interaction, which is really nice. And possibly, you get donors 
as well. I mean, some of the people that live in some of these communities have the wherewithal to donate to the mission that you're, you know, that you're having at your facility. So it's nice to be able to bring them out and show you what you do. Um, the types of facility visits, we do room to room visits and we do group visits. And um, I'm going to start walking around so you guys can pet. With the room to room visits, the only place that we do room to room visits are at skilled nursing facilities and that's it. Any psychiatric facility, kids facility, or clients with Alzheimer's, it is not safe for your volunteers to go into those rooms you know, on their own, and it is not safe um, for that client to be alone with your volunteer. With, I've been um, fingerprinted and background checked. I have been deemed safe with kids. I can't do that for 65 volunteers. It would too, be too much use of our, you know, our donations and our resources. So I watch my volunteers at all times with all of my clients that are kids, definitely. And the same with other clients. You don't ever want there to be a situation where your volunteer is in a room and the he said, she said of, oh, that dog just bit me or that dog just scratched me. So it's always great to have uh, any place where somebody may be confused or have some dementia, have there be supervision at all times. Now we used to, with our room to room visits, I used to just allow my volunteers to go off to the different rooms. We have now changed that to always having to have an escort at the facility that we visit. And that is because when you're going room to room, you are trusting that that facility is posting proper protocol for infectious disease. And I have to tell you, they don't always post it. We've had clients go into a room with MRSA or C. difficile and it's not been posted. And that is a pretty significant, serious issue. One, because humans can get that. The dogs can now get it. They have done studies that dogs can get MRSA and C. difficile. And if for no other reason, the next client down the line that's petting that dog that has interacted with that client can get that infection. So now we require an escort that knows every single infectious diagnosis of every client in that facility that walks us around to room to room. It's also really nice because it's hard for some of my volunteers who aren't as talkative as I am to go in and introduce themselves to a new person they've never met before. And when you have that staff escort, they know that person's name. name. They know if they want to see pets that day. The only downside to that is the fact that Sometimes the staff have a preconceived idea of how somebody's going to interact. And they may say, oh, that person never interacts with anybody. We're not going to even bother going to their room. And those are really the people that we want to see. And so what we do is I do an in-service for that staff saying, please, let, we are happy to see everyone. The only people we want to skip is if there's an infectious disease issue, if there is an allergy issue, or if that person has said to you, I don't want to see the animals. Everybody else we will try to work with. And so it's important that you help that staff know how they can help you with the visits. So with the room to room visits, when we go in and it's in the, um, the volunteer training manual that I gave in your uh, binder, I train all of my volunteers to train that room as if it was their home. Um, you want to knock, always announce, or the escort knocks and always announces and asks for permission. Now when you first talk to those residents, they may not be able to tell you that they want you to come in. I teach my volunteers that you want to make sure you get a verbal or a visual cue that that person wants the visit. And we always err on the side of caution. If they can't tell us, we then go and find a nurse if the escort can't tell us that person wants a visit and ask the nurse to make sure that it's okay. Come on this way. And I know that you're trying to videotape and I'm making this very hard, I'm sorry, but yeah, I know that some people are needing a fur fix, so that's why I'm bringing him around. <laughs> Come here, handsome. There you go, good boy. And this is good therapy for him. So with the room to room visits, we train the volunteers that anything in that person's room is considered an extension of their physical body. So we don't move a tray without their permission. We do not move a wheelchair without their permission. We don't move a walker to get closer to the bed without their permission. So we always ask for that. And then we always make sure we return it to the same position. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a doctor, a nurse, or a visitor come in, move the tray out of their way, which has their remote control, their phone, their call button, everything that they possibly need, and it's 10 feet away and that client can no longer get that. So it's really important that you treat that room as if it was their home. Um, also, we are not there to move the client, feed the client, or give the client any kind of water, anything like that. 
So my volunteers are trained to go and find, tell the escort or find the nurse if something is necessary. Except if there's an emergency, if somebody's falling out of bed, I teach my volunteers, yes, you can catch them and then try to call for help. <laughs> um, and even if you see the water jug, you know, I tell my volunteers, even if you see the water jug right there on the tray, we do not give any kind of sustenance to the client. It may have accidentally been put there and they may, may be on restrictions of thick liquids only and you don't want to take that liability on. We are not trained for that kind of help. We want to stick with what we know, which is the pets. Okay, so those are room-to-room -room visits. Any questions with room-to-room? -room? Um, usually on the front of your door, you're going to have all the information. I feel very strongly with all of our clients that we try to give them as much respect as possible. For a lot of the seniors that I visit, they come from a generation where you greeted them formally until they give you permission to greet them informally. So my volunteers know to look at the front door, find out their last name, and speak to them with their last name. And once you get permission, then you can call them by their first name. It's really important. And it's uh, it's nice to be able to call them that. Also, a lot of the facilities will have um, little shadow boxes. You may have seen this, and you may have seen this, that give you a glimpse into their lives. And so being able to see that they were fighter pilots or that they loved giraffes or something like that gives you one more thing that you can kind of talk about when you go into that room. Now with group visits, we do two different styles. We do presentation style. And we do um, just kind of where we go in and work with the clients. Sometimes you're going to walk into a room, there's just a bunch of wheelchairs um, placed all around the room, and we just kind of walk around and visit. Other times with presentation style, we'll stand up in the front and have the animal um, go around the room while I talk about the animal and do a little bit of education as well, because they really love to learn about the fun facts about the animal. And both works really well. He's getting a nice massage. He says thank you for that. <laughs> So, um, and some facilities like skilled nursing will do group visits and room to room visits. But with the psychiatric, the kids, and the Alzheimer's, it's always group visits. Now with bus tours, um, you'll see that on the, uh, the last portion of the types of visits that we do. Besides on-site visits where we invite groups to come out here for tours, we found that we were spending 20 minutes sometimes offloading people off of the bus and then 20 minutes loading them back on the bus. And that wasn't the best use of their time and the best use of our time. And so we started bringing the bus up close to our building and bringing the animals on the bus, which has allowed for clients to be able to have a lovely drive out in the country, enjoy the animals without the stress of having to move, move because a lot of them wouldn't come out because of that reason, which is really nice. So bus tours work out really well as long as you have good air conditioning on the bus. So the next thing that we have in here is um, volunteers, age, supervision, etc. With volunteers, I will accept any volunteer into the program that loves to work as long as they're 18 years or older. The stuff that you're gonna see at these facilities are, I feel, not really appropriate for children that are under 18. And also liability-wise, you don't want a parent coming back and saying, my child was exposed to somebody who wasn't covered with their blanket. And again, that's something that could put your program at risk. And I've had that happen. I have to say, I was first in the program, I think I was 24, and this man arrives to his front door when I knocked in just black socks. He was in his late 90s. I didn't necessarily want to see that, but I did. And I was glad that I did not have a child with me that saw that as well. Yes, it's quite the image. So um, you have to be careful with the ages that you bring in. Uh, um, supervision, like I said, we always make sure we supervise volunteers with any clients that could be confused or at risk. Also, my volunteers are supervised for the first six months at all times when they do visits. The first time they go out, they have, they watch me. The next two to three times, they are watching other volunteers and I'm watching them take out a rabbit. Then we test their dog or they continue to take out the rabbits depending on what animal they're going to use. But for that first six months, they are never without my supervision. And that way I can address dog issues or handling issues immediately and make sure they get corrected. And also, sometimes some people, they really think they want to do this work. They get out on the first couple of visits. It's very emotional, draining work, and they're just not right for it. And then I can counsel them that there might be a better opportunity here at the center, which I've had to do a few times. So... Um, I think uh, with the training manual, yes, did you have a question? Do, do, you, do, you home, do you do home visits and like home hospice visits? It's a great question. We do hospice visits, and thank you for bringing that up. With the hospice visits, um, about half of them, I'd say, are in the home and half are at facilities. Right. We will not go into the home no. unless they have already partnered with another organization. 
we don't have the wherewithal to screen that home to make sure that it's safe, to make sure that there's not anything that's going to hurt the volunteer. Your hospice group already does that for you, and we require that a hospice volunteer or staff person be present during the visit. So my volunteers are never going into a home by themselves. By themselves, exactly. Because I can't tell you how many times I've walked into um, a home visit, and they have three rambunctious, huge, aggressive dogs that come running out. And I'm bringing in this cute little therapy dog, and one, we have to think, is that the best use of our time to go into this home where they already have dogs there, unless those dogs are not safe for the client? And then we want to visit the client. But I've had it where I walked into a room that it kind of looked out straight out of hoarders, if you've ever seen that show, where I couldn't even navigate to get near the person. I've had visits where the smoke was so excessive in the house then I had brought a bird, and that's really bad for bird lungs, and so I had to leave, and, you know, and then we brought a different animal once it was aired out a little bit. So when you have a hospice staff person, you can ask all of those questions to make sh it's sure it's safe when you go in. So like San Diego Hospice could call you and say, we would like visits for three or four of our patients, yes. and here's what the situation is. Yeah. And I've told hospice, um, we go into facilities as well. There's a San Diego Hospice unit at La Costa Glen, and we go in there and work with the clients. Um, any hospice that wants us, we are happy to go in and help. And also, pets are wonderful support. Um, it's a local group here that helps with clients that have AIDS, making sure they get meal delivery and their animals are walked, or if they're in the hospital, their animals are cared for. If they called and they wanted a visit because the pet had passed away and the person was really having a hard time dealing with it, we would definitely go in. And we do do bereavement work as well. A number of clients, when they pass, the family members are so distraught that we will go in with the animal and it's a consistent loving presence in their life that helps them to transition to the other side of losing their family members. So there's a lot of different work you can do. And I tell my volunteers, um, when we do our visits, we are there for the clients. That's our number one um, priority, but we're also there for the family members and we're there for the staff. I've had where a family member is sitting vigil at a bedside of somebody that's passing away and if you can offer them some comfort with a dog or a cat or rabbit it's amazing i've had family members who truly just lost their loved one 10 minutes before i walked by and i would never go into a room like that i mean that is such a private intimate moment but they saw the dog walk by and came out and just cried into my sheltie's fur for like 10 minutes and he, he's such a good sport he just sat there like okay i'm getting kind of wet but this is okay you know um and we're also there for staff the hardest job in the world is working at a facility like this. And they have very little resources, they have a lot of clients, and if we can make them a happy staff person, the next room they go into, they are that much happier and that much kinder with the resident that they're working with. So it's all a win-win situation. And also, as far as, because we all know that fundraising is an issue in all that we do, with the fundraising, I've had um, visits where we saw this one woman, we were in her facility for 10, or her in her room for 10 minutes, that's it. She enjoyed the dog, I didn't think that much of it, until the next week her daughter came in and said, my, my mother passed away the next day. She was so happy because of your animal visits, and I think she gave $30,000 to the adoptions department. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's, not that that ever would be the reason that we were going in, but it is a great chance for you to get out and to show the community what you're doing. A lot of us, when we have the adoptions department, you're always going to have disgruntled people that you turn down because they really should never have anything but a stuffed animal. And those people in the community are going to tell way more people than the people that have the good experiences. So if you can get out in the community and have ambassadors that are showing what your facility does, as well as somebody says, oh, I've been looking for a chihuahua, and that volunteer can say, you know what, we have a lot of chihuahuas in our adoptions facility right now, why don't you come out and see us? So there's a lot of great things about the volunteers working in those rooms and visiting with everybody. So I'm just, I keep borrowing looking oh, at your no sheet. Worries. I can come up this way. Um, okay, so uh, any questions about with the volunteers when they go out? There's Lots of different personality types that work. Like I said, not everybody has to be really talkative. Some clients want me to shut up, I'm sure. You know, they just want to pet the dog and have somebody be quiet. Other people, the animal is simply a bridge to me, to the relationship that they build with me. And so if I have a volunteer who's a little bit more quiet, that's perfectly great. You know, they're going to meet the needs of one of our clients that I can't. And that's why I like men to be in the program, women to be in the program, lots of different careers, retired, actively working. It's all great. We do have a lot less men in the program, and I think it is really important to recruit men. 
One, because there's a lot of guys that we visit that would just like to have another guy to talk to. But also for the kids that we visit, the men that maybe have been in their lives have not shown them the respect and the kindness that they deserve. And to have kind male volunteers coming in and showing them that men can be okay, I think is really important. And we had one gentleman um, who had, was a, just one of those grandpa kind of figures, and the kids adored him. And he had this big, huge Samoyed that would go in, and they called him her the giant marshmallow. And the grandpa and the marshmallow were the most popular people at this visit because the kids just felt so safe with him. It was really great. So appropriate animals to use in therapy. How many of you have seen dogs actively working in this kind of work? It's, everybody thinks that's the animal that you use. Our smallest dog is 2.8 pounds. She is a Pomeranian. She was abandoned on our doorstep here at the center and um, had a lot of health issues. And she's just the cutest little dog you can imagine. Our biggest dog is 155 pound Newfie. We will accept any dog that can pass our test. I don't believe in breed restrictions. Your test should be good enough that you should be able to weed out a mean golden retriever and test in a great pit bull. As you saw with Lucy yesterday, one of our best therapy dogs that ever happened. She works at a psychiatric hospital for kids. And she has changed thousands of opinions about pit bulls. And also, a lot of the kids that we visit live in communities that have pits and fight pits and mistreat pits. And what an amazing chance to show the kindness that's given to a dog, how that dog can live in a family after that. It's such a great training opportunity. So I believe that any dog should be welcome. Now, many of you may feel in your programs that you don't want to allow any dog unless it's spayed or neutered because we all believe in spaying and neutering anything that doesn't run from us. If they run from us, we chase after them, we spay and neuter. Totally get that. But there are a few dogs that you would be losing out on a wonderful therapy dog if you turn them away. We have a dog that was a, sur um, a breeder dog for service dogs. Phenomenal, phenomenal dog. And I would hate to lose her simply because that rule was so black and white. Also, they're show dogs. I have a couple show dogs in the program that are wonderful dogs, but they're intact. I will say, though, male intact dogs don't usually work. Um, they trigger all of our other dogs like you wouldn't believe. And it's not, again, it's not fair to have one dog be able to come in and have six or seven other dogs on the visit unhappy. So I kind of do it by a case-by-case -case basis in that thing. So um, with dogs, we require DHPP. Um, we require Bordetella. There have been studies that clients with, that are immune compromised can have issues with kennel cough. We require um, a fecal, a yearly fecal, also any kind of fecal if they've gone camping, they've eaten a dead bird on the beach, anything like that. We want to make sure any kind of diarrhea, any kind of change in their stool, we want to make sure that there's a fecal, and we require rabies. We do accept titers. I trust the vets that are taking care of these dogs to know what's best for that dog. If they say that the DHPP is good for three years, I accept that. I accept titers. I think, and you're a vet, correct? DHPP is the only thing that they have titers for, is that correct? Um, distemper, parvovirus, and there are titers for rabies, but they're not recognized by any municipalities or states. Okay. Okay. So. So it's pretty much the DHPP one. It's the, or yeah. not the D, the DPP. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. Why don't you require lepto? That's a zoonotic lepto, disease. It, lepto is not common here in San Diego. It's oh. not really found here. There. I think I've heard of one case in the last. No, there was heartworm 15 years ago. Yes, I've lived in San Diego my whole life. We never used to do heartworm. It, you know, if, if we saw that there was a lot more prevalence of leptospirosis here in San Diego, we would address that and at require, <coughs> excuse me, require. But I think that leptospirosis can also have some side effects. And there's some controversy, at least with vets down here, about sometimes giving the vaccine is not as warranted if it's not that common here. Well, actually, that's kind of a, an urban legend that lepto is more antigenic. But the reality is uh, Ron Schultz published a study out of Wisconsin that showed there was no difference in the reaction rate between DA2PL and DA2P. So. Well, and that's, and that, and again, I kind of trust the vet that's caring for that animal. And some of the vets have said, I don't want to give my clients lepto, and since we're not seeing it. But that is something that definitely, now that you've said that, I'm going to start looking into it more. You always have to take an expert's advice. You want to always look and say, are what we're doing the best that we can do? And we are constantly changing things. We just started changing flea and tick prevention issues here because. And the worst thing with the flea and tick is that you all know you can squirt 100 pounds of stuff on your dogs, give them pills. They're walking into the facility, and a flea or a tick can jump on them and then get onto a client. 
but we still have to constantly be on the cutting edge of what's going on to keep our dogs as clean as possible. So you want to always react, talk to your vets, and you may have a vet at your facility that says, this is what you're going to do and this is what you're going to require. So it just kind of depends on what works for you in your area. So with um, cats, how many of you think cats would be great at therapy work? Yeah. Yay! What do you think is the biggest issue with cats? Allergies. Not allergies, not scratches. I, that's what I thought when I first started getting involved with cats. The biggest issue is the car ride. The car ride. You're traveling a half an hour with a cat, and they are, by the time they get to that facility, they're like, take me out of my carrier, and I'm going to kill you. And so cats, the biggest issue is the car ride. Now, you do have to worry about allergies. You do have to worry about cat scratches. You have to make sure that this is a really amazing cat that's going out to visit. When we take our cats out, they have been trained to stay in a basket or a soft-sided carrier. They are never transitioned onto the client where their claws could interact with thin skin. And that way we make sure that if there is a scratch or that is there is a bite, they're usually chewing on the towel or the blanket or something like that that's in the basket or the soft-sided carrier. The soft-sided carrier also feels very comfortable to cats. It's a, um, if you've seen the ones that have the zip-off tops, and then the client can just reach in there and pet the animal, it works really, really well. So rabbits and guinea pigs. Rabbits make surprisingly great therapy animals. Now the biggest issues with rabbits, not zoonosis, there's very little that you have to worry about with bunnies as far as external or internal parasites, things like that. But with bunnies, the, the great thing about them is that they can be easily brought up to the bedside. It's easy for people to pet. Very few people have phobias of bunnies. In the, I, I joke that unless you've seen Monty Python, you're not too scared of the rabbit. Have you guys seen Monty Python? There's an attack white rabbit that takes out a, like, a bunch of knights. It's, it's a pretty funny scene. Um, but with bunnies, they're wonderful. The biggest issue is the fact that they can't sweat. They can't regulate their heat very well. That's why they live underground where it's nice and cool during the day. We don't take our bunnies out during the summer months. And when we do take them out the rest of the year, we freeze a block of ice. We wrap it in a towel and we put it in the basket with them and it acts like a mini air conditioner for the rabbits and it works out really well. I feel so bad for the first few rabbits that were in our program. We used to walk them around in a towel against us as we were going to the facility and, we, and this was way back, a long time ago. And then we'd wonder why they'd only last for about 10 minutes and then say that they were tired. And that's because we weren't addressing the fact that they were getting overheated next to our hot bodies. So um, rabbits are really wonderful. Uh, we always have the client's pet just on their back. We really, with all of the animals that we're going to talk about today, it should be a partnership. This is not a book that's checked out. It's not a piece of machinery that you're using. It should be an animal that loves the work. And so our animals, we help people pet the right way by setting them up either by visually, visually showing them how we want them to pet or verbally telling them how we want them to pet. And with the bunnies, if the person's a little bit rough, we just back off. We talk a little bit, we don't ever say anything to the client because they can't help that their hands may not be as in control as they'd like them to be. But then what we'll do is we'll send in one of the dogs that can maybe handle, handle a little bit rougher touch. So with the, the rabbits, we're really careful. They get the rest of the day off after they've worked and then they get the next day off before they go back into rotation. And we've found our bunnies have worked for 10 years in our programs, happily doing this type of work. Now with guinea pigs, guinea pigs don't really last the whole hour. Um, they get a little bit squirrely after a while, and so we tend to take them to facility visits that aren't as long. Guinea pigs are great for somebody who has lost the mobility of their hand and it's kind of been frozen into this shape, it kind of fits over a guinea pig perfectly. I mean, they're sausage on feet, basically, so it's really nice and easy to pet them. And they're cute, and they're fun, and they're interesting. There's a lot of fun facts about guinea pigs. With both of those animals, we carry them around in baskets, plastic baskets that ensure that if they go to the bathroom or they scratch, it's into the towel in the basket. And with the plastic basket, it's easy to sterilize it in between. Any questions with those animals so far? How many of you think reptiles would be therapeutic? Yay! <laughs> they are wonderful. For the kids that we visit, if kids have allergies and they're seeing all of their friends enjoying the dogs and the cats, it's really hard on them. Being able to bring in a reptile that doesn't have that dander issue is great. Now there is the salmonella issue. That is a natural part of reptiles and you're not going to be able to get rid of that. And so we have to ensure that there's proper hand washing immediately after a reptile interaction. And with that, be very careful whenever you're using hand sanitizer. That stuff can be absolutely, oh, I thought it was mine. That sounds like mine. Sorry. Oh, no, that, no, no worries. Um, with the hand sanitizer, that can be deadly for humans. If you ingest 
Yeah, I think it's even a couple tablespoons for a, a small child. It can be deadly. Same for animals because it is what, like 98% alcohol. Yeah. So what we always do is when our kids get their hands cleaned, we ask them to wait until they're completely dry before going to another animal and interacting with that animal. And you want to also watch them because I've had a couple clients with Alzheimer's that I put it on their hands and they've gone to put it in their mouth. And that would be very bad. So just really watch when you're using that product. Um, so with reptiles, another great thing with the snakes is that if you have a child with autism, if you've ever worked with kids with autism, they can't really focus on any kind of behavior or activity that they're doing. And yet I've had kids hold a snake and they will hold it for five minutes without moving because we ask them to be a snake tree and ask them to put their branches out. And then the snake is kind of crawling around and they're very into the tactile stimulation of the, the snake going around their hands and they'll sit there for five minutes and then the teacher can use that as a behavior tool of remember when you were a snake tree that's how I need you to stand now and sometimes that can be a breakthrough for that kid and so there's a lot of different benefits with reptiles bearded dragons are great rosy boas are great 13 foot Burmese pythons not so good you want to pick your species based on the ones who are going to enjoy the work and can't hurt anybody if they do decide to bite we do have one horse in the program. The biggest issue is the messes in the facility, so we have to have a facility that we can bring the clients outside. But horses can be really wonderful for people. What not to use? Chinchillas, really not a great animal for pet therapy. If you've ever tried to hold them, they are constant motion. Also, the females can pee with great accuracy at quite a distance if they get stressed. <laughs> not very therapeutic. All of your animals should be um, uh, potty trained you know, when they're going into a facility. Even the bird I'm gonna bring in in just a few minutes is potty trained and she goes into a trash can. It's really important. Ferrets don't really work out well. I, here in San California, it is illegal to have ferrets. We did have ferrets with permits for a while, but ferrets will nibble at the necks of the other ferret to show that they wanna play. And they kinda of saw a lot of people's wrists as the necks of ferrets. And it's, again, not therapeutic to have an animal biting on people. So insurance for the program, um, let's see. You have to make sure you have insurance that covers your program, that covers your volunteers and their dogs. Our insurance only covers the dogs when they're interacting on our scheduled visits. The volunteers cannot go out on their own, find a facility, go visit their mother, unless I set it up and set up a, a, a liability release with that facility. It's just not safe to have them going out. I recommend to all of my volunteers that they get secondary insurance through their homeowners because in California, California dog law is that whoever's holding the leash is ultimately responsible. They would come after Helen Woodward, but they would also go over after the person who is holding the leash. Yes? So the animals you guys are using, you're testing them. They're not certified like by Therapy Dogs International or something like that no. because if you have a certification for your dog through TDI, it comes with liability insurance. It does. And, and with TDI, their liability insurance only covers visits that are done under their umbrella. And Delta Society, their visits will only cover visits that are done as a Delta Society volunteer. So if you have somebody who's certified with Delta or TDI, they come into your program, you still have to have insurance that covers your volunteers because unless you're partnered with Delta, mm -hmm. their insurance won't cover that animal. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you get that covered. If you partner with Delta and you're one of their certified testers and trainers, then all of your volunteers follow it under their umbrella. But I believe TDI just did a major thing that caused them to lose a lot of volunteers in that they said you cannot be active with any other program if you're working with us. And so a lot of people who were working with multiple groups had to switch to Delta to get that coverage. So, you know, again, that's always you want to be constantly looking into those things and making sure you've got that coverage. And, uh, you know, some here in San Diego, you have some breed specific you know, exclusions with insurance. And you have to make sure that the insurance coverage that you get is covering all of the breeds and species that you use. So, okay, I'm gonna switch the page over here. Um, fundraising. The great thing about PET bites, besides the fact that you are going to change people's lives, I mean, we see 20,000 people a year with our program. With one staff person and 65 volunteers, that's how many people we get a chance to see. But the fundraising side of it is also a nice benefit. How many of you have gone to Home Depot and they say, you know what, we only cover seniors? Or you go to Sears and they say we only cover kids. Or you go to Target and they say we only cover psychiatric clients. There's a lot of corporations that have a very narrow focus of what their foundation will help with. And a lot of them don't 
cover animals. But you can go to them now and say, well, this pet therapy program, we work with kids, we work with seniors, we work with psychiatric clients, and you can find that a huge array of grants will open to you with this kind of program. It is also something that you can invite donors to come out and watch and see. They can come on a visit and see the impact that it has for clients, and that's another nice opportunity. They can choose and uh, sponsor visits that are under the, the, you know, the things that they believe in. And like I said, sometimes we're visiting the community where we visit their mom or their sister, and you can get donors that way. So it, I think it is easier to fundraise for this program, much easier than some of the other programs here at the center. And we just had at our black tie fundraiser, we were the featured item in our live auction. And they started out saying, you know, we need people to sponsor this. Would anybody sponsor it at $5,000? Somebody raised their hand at the event. We, I think, made $35,000 just in our portion of the live auction sponsoring the visits with pet encounter therapy. So it does call to a lot of people. And what we did, though, is we had our therapy dogs work in the crowd before the live auction, <laughs> saying, look how fabulous our Bernie's now dog is. Look how fabulous this dog is. And a lot of our dogs that are in our program are alumni. They've been adopted from the center. And so we can also talk about, look at this fabulous adopted dog that now is doing this work. So it's, it, it is, I think, quite, I mean, I wouldn't say easy. Fundraising is always hard, but it's easier. Now, nonprofit versus for profit. We do not charge nonprofit facilities any money to go and visit. It is a completely free service, and 70% of the facilities that we visit are nonprofit. About 30% are for profit. And what would you guess that we charge? $20 to $40 a month. And that barely covers gas here in San Diego. The reason that we charge is one, because we're a nonprofit and we do need help with revenue. We do need money coming in. But also, some for profits appreciate more what they pay for. If it is a free service, the staff doesn't necessarily come and greet you or put it on their calendar. It's like they just expect you to kind of come in. But if it's a service that they pay for, it's in the calendar. There is an escort. They are working with you because it's a program that they're invested in. Now, if a facility is for profit and they cannot afford to pay us, we don't want to turn away a client. That's not our job is to be there for the clients that need us. What we might say to them is, can we use you if we need to have the news come in and do um, you know, a, a spot for the local news? Can we use your facility to come in and do filming? Will you do a towel drive for us? Will you do a food drive for our animals program? So there's other ways to have them invested in what you do besides asking for the fee. OK, any questions with the fees? No? Yes? You know what? The, I should know, but I don't. Has accounting already come in? No. Because accounting, that would be, because the thing is, is the center as a whole gets an umbrella policy that covers all of the volunteers and all of the work that we do and all of the animals that are here on the premises and go out through this program. So it's never been broken down to just what my portion is. It's just allocated based on a formula that they probably have in accounting. Um, cost prohibitive, that, that what I would probably say to that is that like with Delta and TDI, which he was talking about, they do ask their volunteers to pay in to that cost. And I, I want to say with Delta, it's maybe like $100 a year. So it's not that hard for the volunteer to do. And that could certainly help a smaller group. And if I was a small group and I wanted to start this work, I would contact Delta or TDI, go with one of the national groups. And you know they'll teach you how to test the dogs. They can teach one of your staff to be a tester. And then you can get under their umbrella. And then it's just a straight payment to that organization. Now, like I said, you'd still want to have insurance that covers your volunteers. But your insurance company wouldn't charge you as much because there's another organization that's covering that dog when they're working or that cat. Yeah. Um, OK, so problems in, that we encounter. Tester, I know. Your mom's going to be coming in just a few seconds. Yes. Um, with the, the, one of the biggest issues that we find besides the infectious disease, and I tell my volunteers, even if a, even if a um, staff person says it's okay to go in a room, we've been told by the nurses, go in that room, it's okay. We just post those protocols just because. No. My volunteers don't ever go into a room. If there's something posted, if there's that little stand outside the door that has the gloves and the gowns, that is a room we don't want to go into. I had one escort that misunderstood 
what it meant not to go in those rooms and passed by 221 healthy clients to go to the one room in the facility that had the infectious person. Because she thought for some reason that we were there to visit the person with the MRSA. Um, and she walked into that room. Luckily, my volunteers are trained to um, stop at a room like that. They saw the protocol and said, we can't go in there. And she's like, no, 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 that's where you're supposed to go into. They said, no, we cannot go into that room. So make sure that you tell your volunteers to always protect themselves and to go by what they've been taught, not necessarily what the escort tells them to do if it goes against what their policies are. Another issue that we have are facility dogs. Pet therapy is amazing. Since 1980, you know, the 1970s when it started, or even before then, it's grown to be what every facility wants for their clients. So you will get so many calls. I have 28 facilities on our waiting list waiting for service after the 40 to 50 visits that we do a month. And we're only going in once a month, and really, we should be going in every single week. So these facilities go, well, we can't get a therapy dog team to come in here. We're going to get a facility dog. I, you would not believe the dogs that I have seen at these facilities. I have had my dog attacked by a Labrador that was a facility dog. I had to bench press my 30-pound Sheltie over my head while I called for somebody to pull this Labrador off of me. I've seen foxhounds as facility dogs. How many of you have been around a foxhound? How many of you think they would be good facility dogs? This two-year-old huge foxhound rampaged up and down the hallways. It was a staff member's dog. And it would rampage up and down the hallways. You would go into a room with your therapy dog and say, would you like to see the dog? I hate that dog. Get it out of here. Oh, it's not the fox out. Oh, you can come in then. You know, the, the resident, he would steal food off the resident's trays. It finally knocked a resident over and hurt a resident, and that's why the dog was taken off the unit. Um, we had one uh, staff, the, the administrator, had her shepherd attacked our dogs twice and actually punctured the second time. And all we said is for one hour a month, can you please put your dog away in your office? And she couldn't do that. And we had to leave the facility, and the residents lost out because of that. So what we now do is when we go into a facility, any facility dogs have to be put away. If they come and interact with our dogs, it's we do not come back. If, um, we, if we ask the front receptionist, are there any dogs on the unit? Because even if it's not a facility dog, there are a lot of facilities that are letting family members bring animals in, which I think is wonderful. I think it's great that somebody can have their dog come and visit them. But I've gone into a visit, the escort has sent me into a room, and all of a sudden a chihuahua pops out from underneath the covers and you know, it is attacking my bird as I'm trying to visit with that client. So you always want to make sure you know about all dogs on the unit, all cats on the unit, all rabbits on the unit. There used to be this one black cat that would, would stalk and torment our therapy dogs. He'd come just close enough and he'd swish his tail like, this is my facility. And our therapy dogs were like, I'm trying to concentrate on the person. And it just wasn't working. That's Harriet. Yeah. <laughs> We're here. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So, okay. So, I uh, guess Chester's gone. Um, so with the, the visits, you have to really watch for any animals that are on the unit. You, uh, you also have to watch for staff. Um, some staff can be the most inappropriate people that you will ever meet. They will touch your dogs in ways that you didn't think any sane person would ever do. And so you have to, we do an in-service, we always let the staff know exactly how we want our animals to be treated. And, uh, <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh -huh. And I once had to put one of the staff at a psychiatric hospital for kids in a timeout. Because he came over to our chihuahua, Squishy, our three-legged little chihuahua, and says, I'm a hawk. And he comes over and he goes, ah! And he picks her up and says, look, I'm grabbing her and I'm going to eat her. And the chihuahua was looking at him, and so I had to put him in a timeout. Yes, I know. You wouldn't think somebody would, you know, a staff person would do that. So staff can sometimes be an issue. If it is, do another in-service so that, you know, they know exactly what you're looking for. Um, and then the last issue, we already talked about infectious disease. Um, our visits, I forgot to tell you, are about an hour long. We found that really more than an hour is too long for the animal dogs, short term can do longer than an hour, but they're gonna burn out really fast. And watch for burnout. Your volunteers, some of them are so in love with the work that they do, they don't wanna say goodbye to a program they love, and you sometimes have to step in and help them realize that their dog has aged past their comfort doing this work, or is no longer enjoying the work. So with the animals at all times, it's about the animal being really happy. Now I'm gonna walk around Miss Harriet and kind of talk about the work that she does and then you guys are welcome to pet her. And you're welcome to take any photos you want, as long as there's no flash. Now with, hmm? 
you know, because I have to, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance, and then if, if we have time, you can definitely hold her at the end. Miss Harriet was rescued out of Dallas, Texas. She was kept in a basement and pretty badly mistreated. And luckily, as you can tell, any cockatoo that has their feathers is a happy cockatoo, so she never became a feather picker, which was great. Yes. Miss Harriet came here to the center.